to some extent, and you all live scattered all over Little Rock area, and the more we come together, I think the more it just makes sense to me that the more we're together, the more chance we have of, of spreading it. And so that's one of the things that I've tried to be mindful of and be a little bit careful for the for y'all's sake. Uh, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not, I am missing Wednesday night some, to some extent, but I have a Zoom meeting on Monday nights with the Dominicans. I don't know how many of y'all are aware of, this, uh, or of Zoom. How many of y'all are aware of it? Raise your hand if you are. So almost everybody in here is aware of Zoom. Well, uh, of course, they've had some Zoom meetings in the body for the ministry. <clears throat> um, I haven't, I'm trying to figure out where, if it's really benefiting us. I, I can see some detrimental things in it myself. But, but as far as like the Dominican and, and other works, like we have uh, Zoom meetings on Monday nights with the Dominican Republic. We can get as many as 200 people on Zoom, and which we never have, nowhere near that. And uh, and Brother Green, of course, is on there. Of course, you can see everybody. And um, so uh, Brother Green interprets for me, and so we've been having Bible studies every Monday night. And those Bible studies sometimes last, you know, an hour and a half, two hours. Most of the time I try to hold it to an hour, but it always seems to go over. Number one, they still haven't figured out in the Dominican Republic how to start anything on time. So, and, you know, it really, uh, I don't know if it's beneficial, but it certainly gives me an opportunity to work on my patients. When I start Zoom at, at 6 p.m., which is 7 their time, and it's 15 minutes before anybody even gets on there. And it may be another 15 minutes before I can get enough of them on there and get them settled down enough to get started. That's a, that is a big opportunity for me. Um, so huh well my 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 Bible program says I have to log in this time because of updates so well, I gotta figure out what my login password is y'all have trouble with that huh Hmm? Hmm. That's what it's doing to me. Miracle still happening. Okay. <clears throat> um, is there any questions this morning? Any Bible questions or or anything else? Never ceases to amaze me how smart this group is. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, 
I, I may just say a little bit more um, 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 there was a statement here not too long ago about, and I'm not sure if Brother Linegar, it was a quote from Brother Linegar, but if it was, I'm going to change it. <laughs> uh, the statement was that love produces trust trust produces unity and unity produces fellowship I, I think that's pretty mixed up <clears throat> uh, I don't think that I, I would say it this way that fellowship produces trust and it has to be godly fellowship um, if you want to turn to the 133rd Psalm I'll uh, I know you all know it, but we'll read it. Sometimes it helps just to look. Um, <clears throat> what I was going to say was this fellowship produces trust, but it has to be godly fellowship. In other words, um, let's just take uh, let's just take Eli and Kayla. Since she's not in here right now, where she? I don't know where she's at, but we can talk about her since she's not here. <laughs> Um, see, they've been having fellowship, and uh, which you know, it's a that's a relationship. You have to have a relationship. You'll never trust anybody if you don't have a relationship with them. Well, they've been fellowshipping now for a while, and and uh, that fellowship has given them enough trust in each other that they've decided to make it permanent. You know, I think everybody knows they're getting married sometime in December. I think it's the 5th. Is that right, Brother Eli? Y'all all aware of that? If you're not, well, surprise. <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> but my point is, for you know, when a couple does get married, before they can ever trust one another enough to feel like that I, I feel like you're the right person for me, for a spouse, you have to have some kind of trust. Well, with godly fellowship, you know, we're, if we really fellowship in a godly manner, um, eventually it should produce trust. We should have trust. Uh, and then trust will, godly trust, will produce unity. And that's where, and then unity will produce love. Uh, you can't have unity if you don't have trust. That's impossible. And that's where, that's where we're lacking in the body of Christ right now. We don't have enough trust. Uh, the, the Bible shows that uh, in the picture of the, the, the temple, Solomon's temple, there were uh, 12 oxen that the laver set on their, on their backs. They backed up to one another, all of them facing outward. We've always used that as a type that the 12 oxen was a picture of the 12 apostles. And those 12 apostles had enough trust that they could they could back up to one another you know well you have to stay face to face with each other until you can learn you have enough trust to back up to one another you know and so <clears throat> uh, and, and unity this kind of unity that I'm talking about. I'm talking about godly unity. God has to do this because uh, Brother Leninger, if y'all remember, he, he, one of the last messages that he worked on was the difference in confidence and trust. And he taught us 
not to trust any man. Only You can only trust a man as much as you see him uh, trusting Christ and, and, and uh, following Christ. Uh, but he taught us you, you can only trust God. You can only trust the Lord uh, because he's, he's not fallible. He, man, men are infallible. And uh, I mean, men are fallible. Men are not not infallible, and and they can fail. Um, I had someone here recently tell me that um, um, that you can live above sin right now. Um, I certainly believe there's a there is a place that we can achieve. As far as living above the sin nature, I think you're going to have to you're going to have to have the sin nature completely put under. Uh, it's like we were talking about three weeks ago about fornic about uh, iniquity. That iniquity is, you know, men are a few days and full of trouble. You're born in sin. You're born in the sin nature. And uh, uh, and you're shapened in iniquity. In other words, you're shapened in man's ways. That's uh, the ways of man, not the ways of God. And so <clears throat> uh, you're born in a sin nature, and then you're shapened in the ways of man that produces that, that that will produce sin, the sin nature is just you know just because you have a sin nature doesn't mean that you're committing every sin there is, but you're going to have to get out of that nature uh, to and that you know I think y'all know that there's men in the body we're not together on this subject right now there's men in the body that teach you can you can not only live above sin right now but you can make the bride right now. Well, see, I do teach, I teach, I do teach, you can, you can be bride material right now. You can be working and laboring to make the bride. In fact, if you're not striving to make the bride, I don't think you're just. Because uh, we have to be striving to serve God and being obedient and living above all that we know that's wrong. But there's things that goes on in your life that you don't know. You don't necessarily know. Uh, I was just telling you, when I really began to study iniquity, I really, I really got down on myself. I saw so much of myself that I thought, like Paul, I thought, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Uh, and for us to really, you know, I don't think you ought to get down in the mully grubs about it. I think you got to get your mind, you got to begin to look up again. But I think it's healthy to look at, to really see ourselves and really see, uh, you know, that we have how did uh, let, let me let me read this before we'll go I want to go to Psalms 32 but let's let's read this 133rd Psalm it says behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity <clears throat> it's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of the garment. See, godly unity, for us to come into godly unity, it's like the, the anointed, the anointing, that, was, that, you know, the anointing ointment or oil that, that was... Anoint, that was a, that Aaron was anointed with that ran down on his beard and even went down to the skirts of his garment that that 
talking about God, God's anointing and his covering of the Spirit of God being on our life. And I don't think that can happen fully until we really come in first unity. We're going to have to come into unity. And I'm going to say this. I think you have to come in unity with your brother before you'll ever come in full unity with God. Because the Bible says, how can you love God whom you've not seen if you love not your brother whom you have seen? If, you, if, you, if we can't love to learn one another, see, we're going to have to get in a condition that God, and see, there's where unity produces the true love of God and love for your brother. Um, um, uh, he said it's as the dew, verse 3, the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So, you know, if this, the unity, a true godly unity, God working and making us one. That's what Jesus said in John 17, wasn't it? When he prayed and said, Father, make them one even as you and I are one. Uh, <clears throat> that's unity. If you, can, if you can come in the unity with each other like God and Jesus are in unity, that's, that's true unity, godly unity, and it's coming together uh, as one. So uh, I want to say to you that Brother Leniger, I don't believe Brother Leniger meant we can never trust I believe there's a, there's a place in the restored church where there's a ministry that can be fully trusted. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but I think he was saying right now, and really he was working on the ministry more than he was working on you saints, but he was including the saints of God because I know he knew if the ministry can't really 100% trust one another, then... Uh, then how can the people trust one another fully? You know, so uh, somebody has to be an example of trust. So he used the word, uh, he used the word uh, confidence, yes, that we can have confidence in each other. But you have to have the reservation that that person you've got confidence in can fail you. And have you ever heard of a married spouse is having marital problems when they said, I, I don't even know the person that I married. I didn't, I, this person somebody I don't even know. I didn't realize they had this in them. Well, there's, you know, until God helps us get, get beyond who we are and what we are, uh, we need to keep, we have to keep striving a lawful. We have to strive lawfully. Uh, and sometimes we don't even realize that what we're doing sometimes is not lawful. Sometimes we're, we don't realize that there's guile. Everybody know what guile is? Guile is deceit. And you can, you can deceive yourself. Uh, you, you can be deceived. Uh, you know, that's uh, Brother Bud. He preached a message back in 2008. Uh, at the campground, and I was, uh, I was, uh, oh, not very long. I think the week I got home after his funeral, I couldn't sleep one night. It was about 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. I woke up, and I just happened to get on my phone. Uh, you know, I've told you all, if you all have insomnia, just start reading your Bible. Let, let, Alexander Scorby read to you a little while and really pay attention to what he's saying. You, you won't get a chapter done. You'll be you'll be snoozing again. But anyway, I got on my phone and and just happened to have this message of him preaching at the campground. And he was 
he was uh, he, he talked on several things, uh, but it was unusual for him because he preached at night and even had an altar call when he got done. That as before he started taking up offerings in the daytime, and uh, anyway, I got blessed. Uh, he was talking on, uh, and I don't know where he picked up the term, but he he was he was very. Uh, very good about picking up interesting terms or thoughts and then turning them into messages. And so he talked on a paradigm shift. And uh, a paradigm is, it, it's your perspective of things. And of course, when you have, when you, if you can get your uh, perspective adjusted, then you, you can, it can shift. You can begin to differ, have a different perspective. Of things, and uh, so I listened to his message, and it, it blessed me just to get to hear him again. And and uh, but when he got through talking, I had a paradigm shift. <laughs> I was looking at, you know, I was grieving about losing him as a friend. I mean, he, he was a friend to me that I've never had a friend like. He was, um, I'll say this, he was as close to a man that I could fully trust as any man I ever knew. And, I, I, you know, that's saying a lot. Um, you, could, you could number those guys on your four fingers and still have a lot of fingers left. So... Um, you know, so I really miss him, and I talk to him every day on the phone. I, I mean, very seldom ever did we not talk every, uh, every day. Sometimes it's, you know, sometimes he'd just get in his car and go to the store, and on his way he'd call me. He said, well, I didn't have nothing to do while I was driving, so I just thought I'd call you. And then when he'd get to where he'd go, and he'd say, well, I'm where I was going, so I'll, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> so our conversation didn't mount a whole lot sometimes, but but sometimes it would. You know, I mean, sometimes he'd call me, and he used to call me and say, give me something. I'd say, what do you want? He'd say, I need something to preach. I'm fixing to have church, and I, my mind's blank. I can't even think. He said, give me a thought. What have you been talking on? And I'd, I'd give him, you know, something. And he'd say, I can't use that. I can't even, I don't even know how to, give me something else. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> so... Uh, we had, you know, and and uh, so we we'd talk to one another like that, and and uh, <clears throat> anyway, I I came to a paradigm shift of I had been looking at it like you know I lost my this friend uh, I'm uh, I was almost mad at him. You know, I, I looked at him in the cash, and I said, "What have you done to me? What have you done? You know, it's not this ain't right. It's not right for you to just go off and leave like this." But my paradigm shift was, is I need to be thankful that I had such a friend, and I was blessed with that friend for 43 years, and I need to be thankful for what I had that many people never have an opportunity to have. And I need to cherish what God blessed me with, not what he took away from me. So I had it. I don't think I'll be without it 43 years. So <clears throat> I had a paradigm shift. And uh, so, and then he talked in that message about proactive people and reactive people. Which was exactly what Brother Leninger was saying when he'd talk about reacting and and responding. You know, he was he was using proactive people as being uh, <coughs> people that are responsible, people that are are responsible to do their job. Uh, Somebody asked me this week, said, uh, is there a scripture that says God owes no man anything? 
I said, well, <clears throat> God does owe. Don't let anybody tell you God doesn't owe anything. Now, he, he pays. God repays. But God's responsible. He, he, he created this. He has a responsibility. Anything you do, you have a responsibility. If you created a child, you got a responsibility to that child. you got a responsibility to train it up. you got a responsibility to discipline it. You've got a, he's got a responsibility. I don't, know, I, don't know what, I don't know what he does to keep this world going. He's, got a, he's building a body. He, he, he's, made, he's developing a people. He's got a responsibility to that, and he is fully responsible for everything he's ever done. And uh, he's responsible to judge. He's responsible to judge those that disobey as well as he is to reward those with good, you know, with judgment of um, favor and blessings to those that do obey and those that do follow instruction. And so God, God, uh, He is a proactive. We're serving a proactive God. <laughs> he He's not reactive. Brother Bud said in this, in this, I, I couldn't believe it. He told about having this little poodle dog named Muffin. I sold him that dog. He didn't even give me credit in his message. He never even mentioned me. And I sold it to him for half price. I mean, that's like, you know, I don't remember what I was getting for them little poodles back then, maybe $800 or something. So I'd let him have it for 400 I don't even know if he said thank you when I did that, you know. I think he really wanted me to give it to him. I have people ask me all the time, would you take this? I said, no, you know. I said, that's like a stranger walking up to me and saying, would you give me $400? I don't have $400 to give to strangers, you know. And, and you know, so, but I tell them, I don't mind you ask, I don't mind you ask me to, to take less because I wouldn't buy one off of you without asking you. That don't mean that I expect you to do it, but if you will, I appreciate it. I will say thank you. <laughs> uh, at least I'll try to remember to. But you know, let me just say this while I'm talking about that. Um, one time when we lived in uh, Midland, Texas, we needed uh, some more speakers for our church. And this guy had some speakers in the, in the paper. I mean, back in those days, we didn't have iPhones and everything. You know, you had to have, read an ad in the paper written down. And, and this guy was selling some really nice speakers. And uh, he was asking, you know, so much for them. And I went to see them, and I looked at them, and, I, and they were nice. And they was worth what he was asking for them. I don't remember what he was asking. Let's just say he was asking six hundred dollars, and I, I, I uh, see this is part of this iniquity that that's in me. I said, "See, I'm I've I've been I've been a car salesman, and let me just tell you right now, you don't ever want to trust a car salesman." <laughs> I had a guy, Brian. I never will forget Brian Peters. He worked at Main Lincoln Mercury in San Antonio, Texas with me. And he had this, this little old lady. She was in her, up in her 70s. And he was showing her all these cars. And she had, we had this little car she liked. And so he's out there in the office talking to her. I was sitting over there in the next desk. And Brian, he, he, he uh, I think he'd been in a Baptist church a few times in his life, but it was rare. And uh, so this little lady, she said, well, she said, this sounds good, and I like that car. But she said, I, I'm going to have to pray about this. And he said, Miss Williams, he said, do you believe God wants you to, wants to bless you? She said, well, I do, but I, I always take everything to the Lord in prayer. He said, 
do you like this car? She said, yes. He reached over and grabbed her hand and he said, Miss Williams, let's pray. <laughs> he hesitated there a few minutes and he looked up and he said, I believe he wants you to have it, don't you? And he handed her a pen. <clears throat> anyway, I don't know why I got off on that, but yeah. Well, he's telling about that little poodle, you know, and he was saying, what he was saying, my point was, is he's saying they're, they're, re, they're reactive. They're instinctive. They just do everything by reaction. He said they don't have an imagination, but I think he, I think he might have been wrong about that because my dogs dream. I mean, they'll be over dreaming and they, they'll bark even. Or sometimes they growl. <laughs> so they're dreaming about something. that has to be something going on in their imagination. He, you know, anyway. Uh, but anyway, he, he, he said he was praying that somehow God would make a way for her to go to heaven. <clears throat> and uh, I understood that because I, I thought that about Sophie, my little girl, my little toy poodle. I, she spoke in tongues. I thought so. I mean, you couldn't understand her. So, so I thought, well, maybe, you know, God will consider her if, uh, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, but, but anyway, he was talking about being proactive and reactive. Just, you know, how we can not, we can, we can um, react to, to, circumstances and situations that we get involved in uh, it, it does so much it, it benefits so much to pause and not answer situations that you don't have to answer you know I mean you can't you can't go to an auction and while they're auctioning off what you're wanting to buy, you can't say, i got to pray about this. <laughs> you can't do that in an auction. It, that don't work. You need to pray before you go. <laughs> God, don't let me make a mistake. Uh, but but I've, I have learned, in fact, a lot of my employees and, that I've had in life and certainly my wife and uh, a lot of people in the churches that I've pastored have got pretty aggravated at me because I they feel like I won't hardly make a decision. I'm too slow about making decisions. But I've just learned that when there's a problem or a situation and I don't have, or I may think I have the answer, but if I've learned if I can put it off, there will be new things that I'll get new thoughts. There will be new uh, information and new thoughts that I'll get. That And if I pray about it a little bit and just watch, in fact, there's a lot, a lot of problems that goes on in churches that I've learned not to touch. And most of the time, they'll work themselves out if you leave it alone. Kind of like stirring around in a bed of coals. You'll get a fire going if you mess with it very much. If it's simmered down, <laughs> I'd say leave it alone, see if it'll keep simmering. You know, <clears throat> there's some things you have to deal with, just like buying things at auctions. I know you can't wait, but... But there's other things that, you know, is in, I think is very, very good uh, to go slow and consider. Uh, I was going to say something, I may have already said it, about uh, iniquity that was in me. What did I say about that? Huh? My what? Oh, those speakers, yeah. Yeah. I told that guy, I said, uh, these speakers are worth, I think, what you're asking for them. But I said, but I, I, I really, I really need to, I need them to be less than that. He said, I can't take no less for them. I've already come down. He said, they're worth more than that. But he said, I need to sell them. I need the money. But I can't take no less. And I said, well... Let me make you an offer. He said, I can't take an offer. I, I think I said something like, I'll give you $400. I knew they was worth every penny he was asking for. I mean, I had the money to pay it. 
But see, I'm... I mean, you'd think I wore a little beanie on my head at times when it comes to things like this. And uh, so I, I, I mean, I, I wore him down, and I finally walked out the door, you know, and left, and drove off. But I got about a mile down the road, and the Lord dealt with me. And I felt like the Lord said to me, that's wrong what you did to that man. That man's got a good price on those speakers. They're worth what he's asking for it. And you shouldn't take advantage of it. You turn around and go back and repent to that man and pay him every dime that he's asking for them speakers. I thought, devil, get behind me. <laughs> but he said, this ain't the devil talking. This is God. <laughs> So I turned around, went back, man, I was, it was hard. I went up that door and knocked on it. That guy answered the door, and he said, I told you I'm not taking no less. I said, well, can I talk to you a minute? So I, I said, I need to repent to you. I said, see, I've, this is in me. I've, you know, I'm, I'm a salesman, and I've, you know, I always try to get the best deal I can get. And I said, I'm also a child of God, and I feel like God rebuke me and I was, see that was guile that was in me really or, uh, taking advantage of a man in his situation and uh, I was talking to <laughs> I was talking to a man about this the other day and he was telling me a guy, about a guy that took advantage of his of his truck and uh, anyway he he was telling about how he had to go through something like that to repent. And while he was talking to me, these guys was working on his house. And he said, this was a preacher in the body. He said, he said this guy's working on, on this job. I said, well, did, what kind of price did he give you? And he told me. And I said, did you agree to pay the price? Is, has he done you a good job? He said, yeah. I said, did you agree to pay him the price? And he said, well... I really did, but I, I really didn't. But I think I'm going to go ahead and pay him. And I said... You just gonna pay him what he asked? He said, "All right, I'll give him a little extra." <laughs> so, anyway, God's working on all of us, I know. But anyway, <clears throat> we're all we're having to. If you're proactive, you have to learn how to be independent. But you can't stop at independence. You know, you got to be. You have to be. Uh, see, a, a, a reactive person is dependent. They're dependent on drugs, prescription drugs, alcohol. They're dependent upon their way of life, whatever it is. Uh, but a proactive person is independent. They learn how to be independent. But like I said, you can't stop at independence because you can't be independent and ever come into unity with anybody. And that takes learning interdependence. To learn how to work together with other proactive people. And, and to ever come in unity. This unity that this 133rd Psalm is talking about is um, is uh, is a godly unity, and only God is going to help us be able to get there. I said I was going to look in the 130, 32nd Psalm, in the fifth verse, where it says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. In other words, you, you forgave the ways that caused me to sin. So it's not just the sins. It's not just getting the sins forgiven. But it's getting forgiven for the ways of what causes us to sin. This 
this nature that we're born of. That 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 may take us to wanting to look into the blood of Jesus. You know, to be able to explain how do you explain the red blood of Jesus? What did what did him shedding his red blood do? And what does it really mean in the new covenant? Is it just mean red blood? There is an efficacy to the red blood of Jesus, but there's far more efficacy, which means life, to the symbolism of red blood and what it really means, which is the Holy Ghost, the life. See, the sacrifices under the under the Old Testament was had to be the blood of the sacrifice that had to be offered up. And God did that because the life was in the blood. Jesus' life was really the Holy Ghost. It was the Spirit of God. That's what's going to have to be applied to your life more than red blood. But red blood fulfilled the law. And so his death had a great meaning in fulfilling the law and letting us see the full reality of why he gave his life. If he had came to this world and just offered up his life on the cross, it would have no meaning. If he didn't live a life in the Spirit of God and the Holy Ghost and overcome the sinful capability of the flesh, if he hadn't overcame that and been the example of that and then gave us the Holy Ghost as a new birth, which was the blood being applied, the, the true meaning of the blood of Christ being applied to your life in a new birth that would rid you for sin. He, his sacrifice perfected us all. That don't mean that you're perfect because he died on the cross. It meant if you go through the death of the flesh by the Holy Ghost that he went through, he'll perfect you. He'll make you worthy of life. Praise God. All right, we're out of time. Anyways, uh, good to be back home today. We'll take a break and go upstairs. Brother Michael and Sister Cindy aren't here today. And Sister Smith's not here. She's We, have, we had a dog going to labor, having puppies this morning. So well, she hadn't started having them yet, but it looked like she was going to. So. So we almost called Sister Jerry and told her, you go do it and let Sister Smith come to church. But we decided to let her come to church instead. All right. God bless you. I'll see you upstairs. <laughs>